Unified Land Development Code. So we can we can get into that. Paige, do I need to? Are we okay here, or do I need to? Yeah, I'm gonna. I was just gonna let them wait till we break again, so that okay. we can keep stopping for interviews. We just need to let Rashawn through the gate. We just need to let Rashawn through the gate. The, the gate closed. Oh, it shut on. Oh, okay. The gate closed. They must I'm have closed that. It was open on. I just pulled in and it was open, but huh? You didn't close it by. Which one is it? Not that I know. We got two gates. The one down at the bottom down here should be open. That may be as well. The one at the top may have closed. Tell him to come back out and turn left. Yeah, he's at the one at the top. Tell him to okay. come down to the lower gate down here. He's at the one up by the house. That one's got a mind of its own. While y'all are looking at that, if you will turn to your next tab uh, where the ULDC is uh, included. And there are, uh, there are a number of items that I would like for y'all to be familiar with on this. As y'all know, this uh, the creation of this <coughs> current document uh, began 13, 14 years ago, and it would it initially began over uh, family ties issues and uh, five acre requirements on construction. So, in order to address that, the commission at that time felt that they should rather deal with those one or two items, look at the entire land use for Lowndes County and create a document that could be amended and adjusted depending on the demands and on the changes that take place in our community and are reflective of the type of community we want to be in the future by the decisions we make now concerning um, land use and uh, to some case zoning, not that they're always the same. Um, you'll note that there's two big items that came along. One is protection of Moody Air Base. That was uh, when Commissioner Evans was on the board. That was a really, really big item to prevent around Moody Air Force Base what many military bases have uh, suffered from throughout the country, and that is growth developing right outside of the, uh, the base and thereby restricting the growth and the potential missions that would be associated with that, with that base. Um, many of you have asked about, well, how many changes have we made to this? Two to three hundred is a good estimate on how many of these items we have looked at and how many times we've made changes. Now, what that what I'm saying by that, you're going, you may say, well, I don't recall 300. Well, you may have only had, as this said, 17 items, I mean 17 amendments, but in those amendments, you had a number of items that came up and were addressed. And we've tried to do that every year to, and when Jason was here, do it on a relatively frequent basis annually of looking at things that have come up, things that are of concern, how do they need to be addressed, or do they need to be addressed? So, you know, I, I have heard from several of you say, we need to look at the ULDC. And I, I do not disagree, and I, I agree that it is a, a product that we need to consider. I would suggest, as I have to each of you, I would look at this when you do not have a, a issue that is that the public emotional. is passionate and emotional about, and you can look at these issues from a 10,000 foot level and evaluate them as to their long term impact, not who the person is standing at the podium asking for a change. So, Chairman, that's it. If y'all want to begin to break this down. Well, I, I think so because there has been a discussion with the commissioners about ULDC, but it's, my concern about it is that it's just been very broad. 
I'd like to get into the ULDC. Each one of you has had a copy of the current ULDC as it stands now. Uh, you've had it for a couple of weeks, I think, uh, an opportunity to, to go through it. Is there any, let's just start here, is there any specific section or issue in the current ULDC that someone would like to address that maybe they've had some concerns about? You'll also find behind you the Lowndes County zoning map um, that shows you where our current zoning uh, concerns are. Um, you know, I, I'll bring up one that's just to get the conversation started. You know, I, I had discussed this at last year's retreat, and there's been some discussion about it. But, but I still have a concern about these private water systems. In, in the county, and we'll get a little deeper into that during um, during the utilities session. But as you know, the current ULDC says that if you're within 1,000 foot of county water and sewer, you're required to hook up. Now, along those lines with those private systems, does anyone think that there may be a need to increase that distance that distance requirement um, and and what I'm thinking of course we don't want to put any more of a burden on the developers more cost on to them unless we feel like that, that can be a shared cost but do we need to increase that distance for the benefit of Lowndes County's water and sewer system the growth of it in other words requiring it and I'll give an example if we increased it, for example, to 5,000 feet, then it says that if any development is within 5,000 feet of county water and sewer, then it would, that development would need to be on county water and sewer. Hypothetically, at this point, if you're not going to put any more burden on the developer, then the, the burden would fall on the county to extend their water and sewer that 4,000 feet while the developer still picks up that that thousand foot distance. Now I know that that's a great more cost on the county, but if you're going to continue to expand your water and sewer system to develop it out as well as reduce the number on these of these private water systems, do we want to go down that road? Or is everybody comfortable at this point with a thousand foot distance? Minimum required. I think it's together. I'm not sure 5,000 is the right number, but I think it needs to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm just using that as, yeah. as, as if right. we increased it, say another thousand, do we know what that would bring in? I that think point? that that's something that we would look for utility to give us some additional information on, and, and I, I thought along the same lines that whatever that number changes, how is that going to affect what we currently have as far as our infrastructure of water and sewer? How is it going to affect that um, from the standpoint of, of development, you know, from development standpoint? I think we need to be conscious of developments. Um, you know, we've had recent rezoning cases that were relatively large developments, but we don't have infrastructure there. Um, it doesn't mean that this would address that infrastructure, but you've got to start somewhere with a plan to move that infrastructure out so that you can serve development as it comes along. Uh, currently, right now, uh, our plan is, you know, is, is to expand it, but our expansion plan right now is more on connectivity than it is on expansion. So I think we need to consider is that something that we want to look at as well. Well, my opinion is I think that we, I think that's a, not that that's a detail, but, I, but I'll just use that word. I think that's a detail we're talking about before we know what the bigger plan is. I mean, I agree and see where you're going, but for me, I mean, I'm, I'm still looking at it from a higher level thinking, you know, I mean, it's no secret that the development community is, is seeking property on the north end of town. I mean, we've seen that in at least two controversial rezoning cases lately. And I feel like we're not doing our job at clearly trying to either steer the development community in areas that we're going to promote growth. Um, and I feel like we're, we're going to potentially find ourselves in a position where we're, where we're losing 
<coughs> opportunities because we're not able to say, hey, here's the county's plan for water and sewer. Here's, here's where we're generally encouraging you to go because the, the whole contiguous thing is just, in my opinion, is, is, is not working. I mean, I, I don't like spot zoning. I'm not encouraging that, but I'm just saying we can't. It's not practical to think that we can grow parcel by parcel from North Dallas Road to towards Hay Higher North. So I think that we've got to figure out among ourselves, you know, Clyde Stone Road, for instance, is, you know, are we going to pay that next? What does that look like? I'm sure there's developers already knocking on doors right now. So how are we prepared for when that next case comes up to say, you know, we're going to have one or two here. So back to what you started out by saying, I think that 1,000 to 5,000, I, I don't know what that number needs to look like right now because I don't know where our infrastructure is headed to. And I don't know where we're encouraging developers. Mr. Pritchard, can you collaborate? One of the things that we can, to address what Scott is saying and basically what all of you have said along the way is we don't necessarily want to take ULDC and throw it out the window and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. But what you do want to do is look at those issues and see how they could be tweaked or amended. Well, what you see on this page is a recommendation by staff that you bring in a consultant to help you work through these issues based on their experience, pitfalls that you can avoid, but yet meet the needs of this community in the vision that y'all have. So, you know, one of the things that I would recommend is rather than say, well, this is the change we want to leave here with, is give us what those items are, water and sewer, areas of development in the North Lambs. All of these topics that staff will sit down and put together, we will come back with a recommendation to y'all concerning a potential consultant, one or more, and then the process where you sat down with those consultants and say, these are our concerns and these are our issues. And there's a series of questions at the bottom of that page that will help you, I think, if you look through that, give you an idea of what you might want to put on this list or comments you want to make that Paige is going to put on the list and send a copy to y'all and say, these are items that you brought up. Is this still what you want to do? Well, and I agree as far as the end process to basically pull it all together. But as you had said earlier, I've heard a lot of comments about ULDC and the need to address some issues in it. So, do we identify what those needs are here? Yes. If yes. there really are yes. concerns, I mean, Let's that's what I'm getting it. at. And, and that's the reason I started with the one that I have a concern with, and that's it, it has to do with that water and sewer connectivity, which is part of the ULDC requirement. So I want to hear some other ideas and some other issues that yeah. folks have with ULDC. I, I think, Bill, what you're suggesting kind of brings together a lot of even the concerns that we've expressed over the last couple of years, because I know one that we've talked about has been just the issue of failing systems. When a system fails, all of a sudden we got this pick up the pieces after they done made their money. That's a big part of my money. concern. Yeah. And I think what, you, what, you, what you're saying kind of addresses that and even ties into what Scott and some of the other concerns. Yeah. Now some of those things, some of my concerns aren't actually addressed in ULDC. It's more in the regulations that goes through the utility mm -hmm. standpoint of part, as far as subdivision development and that infrastructure. I do have some concerns there as we've talked about. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense, just to say this, it doesn't make a lot of sense for a developer to put a development in. Our requirements are is that they put fire hydrants in there, but yet their water system won't supply the water that's needed to those fire hydrants in the case that, that you have a fire. That makes absolutely no sense to me. So that's something that needs to be addressed as well. Uh, whether whether we do that through the regulation, the regulatory side, or whether we do it through ULDC, but that's the overall picture on on developments. Now, again, I, I just want to see because you know we keep hearing ULDC, so I want to find out what the real issues are. Well, I think the five the five acre minimum for 
EA in the two and a half acre minimum or RA, I think it's too restrictive. I think it's too restrictive. Too restrictive. Okay. I, I don't agree. I think it's fine. Five acre down to two and a half acre. If we were to reduce that and say to two and a half, then if we want to go lower and lower. But we need to protect our rural area and our uh, agriculture and our forest lands and stuff like that. We, I, I agree that this is a great topic and all, but we need to plan and develop wiser than just going out, say, 10 or 12 miles from the city city limits and start a development. Well, and, and I think that that's the, the whole purpose. We're, we're not talking about, about yeah, we're not talking about, Mark, a, a particular development. We're talking about what are we going to do as commissioners to plan for growth in Lancaster. I know what we're growth talking about. Coming. I'm not speaking of a particular development. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I don't think we should have a development way out of town where we're punching holes in the ground for wells and septic tanks and all that. We need to do like we're saying to be able to provide infrastructure to the development. So that's, that's wise development to me. Mm -hmm. And Mark, I mean, I'm saying the same thing you are. I'm saying, let's plan for that. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's not, I'm not making up the 6,000, 11,000 cars on 41. I mean, I, I'm, you know, it's not me and my family running back. There's people there's people transferring between North Valley yeah. and, and Hay Hire. Same thing with, with Valdale Road. So that's where the where, where the people want to go. And I think we need to listen and we need to say, and I, I agree with you that we need to protect some of those rural areas. But when you've got major arteri arterial roads like that and people are traveling and that's where people want to be, then I don't think we just continue to let the, the ULBC function as it is without revisions and that we um, we just let one developer after another come before us and us say no, 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 no. We need to get, we need to say, we need to look at those two areas specifically and say, do we want to promote growth in those areas? Do we want to make changes to the ULDC in those areas? Like Clay said, do we reduce that five acre just in those specific areas? Because that's where people are desiring to go and that's where the, the, the cases are coming from. I mean, otherwise we might as well just say, I mean, we might as well write in the ULDC. Well, if you're if you're further north than than latitude, longitude, this, then don't even come to us with a request. Don't waste your money because we're not going to approve it. But so that's what we're this, saying. We're kind of all saying the, the same five thing. and the two and a half would be encouraging people to do that size. Well, Jim, maybe what we're looking at, we're talking ULDC here, but are we talking more of a zoning issue? You're talking about reducing EA which changes those numbers from acreage. But then, Scotty, back to what you're talking about, are we looking more at rezoning some property up through these corridors to a certain point to allow for the higher density? density? Well, that's, that's what the kind of what I'm hearing. Has here, that's zoning that's districts and uses. Well, it does, but then to do it, you've got to rezone those areas. If you're talking about changing the current zoning, if, if if it's EA or RA, and we currently have two and a half, five acres, back to your point of protecting that those larger tracts, then do we look, coming back to your point, do we look at those corridors where people want to live, as we're seeing the trends are taking place, that want to live in the incorporated areas, then do we look at it from the standpoint around those corridors? Do we begin to look at changing the zonings in that? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's what I'm talking about. Just in those corridor areas. I think that that's really, I mean, you're both saying pretty much the same thing. You want to protect rural Lowndes County and, and leave everything at two and a half to five acres for RA and EA, and you're saying, you know, reduce it, but at the same time you can reduce where your needs are, Scotty, by just looking in those corridor areas from the standpoint of potentially rezoning some of that property up those corridor areas to a look to a really to a higher density zone, which then gives us a little bit of direction from the standpoint of where we take utilities and yeah. the developer direction as well as far as where that growth is going to be at. Right. And, 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 and also gives the. Um, <coughs> 
the people's expectation of what we what we're expecting. So, you know, right now we get a lot of comments about, well, you know, that's not what the ULDC says. It says it needs to be five acre lots. Well, I think if you change some of that zoning, then this is what we're expecting to grow in, in this area, whether it's Valdez or North or 41, old 41, whatever. Well, let's take, let's just take for example, and you brought up Pipestone Road. Pipestone Road is a road that we already know <coughs> we're going to we're going to pay Pipestone Road. Or we're going to run water and sewer. Down. Water and sewer, and my understanding is planned to go right. down Pipestone Road. So if that's the case. Then we need to address the result, the zoning potential for Pipestone Road because it's not going to make any sense to have a tremendous amount of EA property that we're running infrastructure on that we will not be able to get a return on that investment because we don't have a density there. So it makes sense to address those areas and change that zoning for Pipestone Road for that property. What will trigger the change? Is it from the property owner making the request, or is it from the commissioners looking at those areas and making that request? I mean, making that change. I think for the purpose of it, I think for purpose of planning, uh, we're going to need to go ahead and make those changes because if not, once you do that, then we're going to have a much higher influx of requests to change it anyway. Simply because a developer goes out there and identifies a piece of property, he's you know he's going to have to get it rezoned. So then we get back into the issue of of we're spot zoning in one sense because we're out there on Pipestone Road. So do we want to go ahead and look at some of these tracks potentially to zone them um, for a lower density development? Now do we do we go to the very lowest density or that's my point. Or do we go to a typical, typical subdivision R21, something along those lines, um, zoning? I think we've got to be reasonable along the back. But again, to me, and I have to look at it from the standpoint of, and I hate to say everything is tied into financially, but reality is, is that if the county is going to supply the infrastructure, the water and sewer, there has to be at least a break-even point there that it, that we can justify putting that, that infrastructure out there. Well, that was the question I was going to ask if, if Stephanie or Harrison could answer. Um, I mean, I've heard Elliot Eisenberg, who is supposedly a you know, world-renowned economist, and he's worked for NAHB and various other groups. Um, I've heard his argument that residential rooftops do pay for themselves. But I've also heard, I mean, I've, I've heard all over the board. So do y'all have any current information, <coughs> thoughts? No, is there not. anybody we can seek that information from? The reality is the growth's going to occur anyway. So, yeah, I know there are people that say, oh, no, we want more businesses. Businesses return more to a government than households. But that... But in the end of the day, you're going to have home somewhere, and you're going to have growth. But you're also, you almost need a plan that goes out a decade or more, because not only are you talking about just a development, you're now talking about road development and water sewer infrastructure. Your road development's going to come into play because we already got roads that are jam up with traffic. Well, if you're going to put more people out there, you're going to get long term. Let me kind of give you a bigger picture of things right now. And it, it does fit what everybody is saying. Highway 41, use that as a corridor. And North Valdale, Austin, I mean, I'm sorry, Valdale Road as a corridor. Currently under the TIA plan, we're planning on paving roads that interconnect those two. East and West. And so you're going to be looking at growth potentially just because that, that improvement is taking place out there. So it makes sense, as I've said in the past, it makes sense for us to to try and stay with that growth rather than saying broadly, well, we need to run water and sewer all the way up by Dale Road and all the way up 41, and then of course then it makes sense to connect it when you don't have the development there yet. Scott, to answer your question, we have two studies. One that was conducted by 
Georgia Tech, one that was conducted by the University of Georgia. They are dated at this time, uh, so I would not stick strictly to that without looking for an update on those. But when those studies came out, especially the two of you involved in the construction industry, directly or indirectly, is when we began to discuss impact fees mm -hmm. because of the studies saying <clears throat> those rooftops did not compensate and should there be an a, uh, impact fee on those. That obviously was a very touchy subject that the Commission backed away from where communities in North Georgia, especially in that metro area, like Gwinnett, they had had not only impact fees, but they had a declaration of no construction for a number of months, if not years. There's so, some that new ones. Oconee County just put some, yeah, they put some strict stuff in there too. But we're, we're not saying we're in that category, but there are answers out there that we can get <clears throat> with the instruction from the commission to have those studies updated and f find out what that impact is today compared to what they were 15 years ago. One of the things that you can't discount was something that we talked briefly about Monday night, and that's the consumption of public safety services. That's really where anytime you have a more dense population and you start that, then you've got to roll more public safety, and that's going to include animal control and ambulances. And I think it's, it, yeah, and fire, but it's, but whenever they have to go, like Commissioner Weisenbaker said, 12 miles out, and they're always hitting a pocket 12 miles out. Well, now it makes sense to build stick. We're going to put up an EMS station. We're going to put up another fire station. And so then we have big chunks of capital that start to follow things other than just the operational costs. But isn't that what we want? I mean, I mean it's got to be smart, but isn't that what we want? I mean, is, is anybody in this room saying, we want to be like Mayberry, or that's not a good example. <laughs> we want to stay like we are. We don't want to grow. We don't want to provide better and more services for our community. We just want to keep the wheels on the bus, and you know, and then after one term, two terms, then we go off into the woods. We want, we want to grow, but we want to grow wisely. Well, yeah, we'll look, at, look at the numbers you just showed us, though, the, the, the tax digest. Is, is declining in at least one of our cities, mm -hmm. a major city. I mean, ours has gr has grown a little bit, but I mean, at the end of the day, if we don't increase the the total volume dollars, whatever, in our tax digest, then our only other way of keeping up with the additional expenses that we have to do year after year. I mean, uh, employee benefits, the stuff, the revenue. I mean, the, the expenses that are just gonna happen regardless. If we're not increasing our tax digest every year through new properties and through the dissecting major pieces of property and more tax revenue, then the only other option we have is to raise property taxes, right? I mean, is it really as simple as that? Well, of? well, let me just add this, and I don't mean to cut y'all. Hope I didn't. But the reality is, is that you're both saying the same thing. You want to get to the same location. It's how you get there. And I think it's important from the standpoint, if you want to say smart growth from that side, it's important for the county to do our part to encourage development on, on to your point, but for us to do the smart things that we need to do to be able to encourage development in particular areas. And you do that with uh, paved roads and infrastructure. And so that's how you do that. It makes that property automatically more attractive and more uh, appealing to the developers. Um, again, that would that would minimize. You're not going to stop a property owner that wants to maximize his investment on a piece of property that he's obtained, whether he's whether it's been a family farm or whether it's a private investor that's going out there and bought a piece of property, when they're ready to stop 
uh, their agricultural operation and retire, a lot of these farmers, their, their retirement plan is selling the farm because their children have gone on to do other things. And so they want to be able to maximize that investment in that piece of property. We can't be the ones that makes a decision of whether they made a good investment or, or that they're able to maximize it. We're put in that position because right now it is restrictive based on the current zoning that we have it is restricted because then we have to make those decisions to change that zoning to where if we begin to work a process and agree that we want to be a part of that that development plan then we then will play a role in it and that's the reason i say we, we as we look at it i think it's more an a, more of an issue that we begin to look at changing the zoning in some of these areas Leave our RA and our EA alone so that so that those larger tracks folks that want five acre plus, they'll be able to have them. Um, but we need to look at areas that potentially we can identify that those areas need to have a different zoning on them so that then when we put our roads and our infrastructure in, we're not conflicting with ourselves and with our documents as far as what that zone is. And those areas are the most desirable areas in town like north. Right. I mean, we know pretty much that east of Val is as flat as this floor. Yeah. And that's not that desirable. Well, for yeah. good, large development. That's right. So we're all saying the same thing. It's just a matter of how we're going to get there. there. You, know, you know, sometimes we have to stop think that smart growth don't mean necessarily we have to have a thousand separate tanks and two or three private water systems, but how do we come up with something in between that yeah. that we can make work? Yeah. So. I think you hit it on the head, uh, Chairman, um, uh, because I, I just I just recall a lot of these very <coughs> controversial uh, zoning cases that we dealt with in, in all the cases when I go out there and talk to the people and and ask how they try to um, sell the property. Will the neighbors buy the property? And the neighbors saying no. But they don't want to develop the property. They don't want the person to sell their investment. So it's just one of the things I think standardizing, coming up with the, the core of plan would be a great move. I think, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be left up to us to take that initiative to give direction on where that development is going to be going. We know where it is. We have the data. We have the trends that, that we need to address. Um, growth in the unincorporated areas of Lowndes County. So we have that responsibility to begin to make those adjustments and those changes that we need to. Then staff is going to have to give us the guidance on how we get there. And I think that that's really what they're searching for. You have already, as has been, been um, pointed out, you have staff recommendations on changes that need to be made. Um, I wanted to identify here with the commissioners specifically do you have any other issues in the ULDC that you have a concern about that staff needs to know about so that they can add to their list of recommendations. And then we'll have to decide at a point, if, are these changes something that we need to get involved with a consultant? to handle it for us, or is this something that we could do more on a smaller scale with staff or with some contract staff maybe that we could bring in to address this and look at it and see if those tweaks can be made. You know, we've heard everything from throw it out and start all over again to let's look at what the changes need to be made. I'm the guy that says let's look at what we've got, look at the changes that needs to be made come up with those and then decide are these changes something that we can do or do we need to are they extensive enough that we need to then move to a consultant such as the Gail e Easley group that done this originally to bring them back in and update the ULDC. So I think that's what staff's looking for. And us. You, you'll see in there there's uh, information concerning the uh, budget that was established for this under the Easley firm uh, in 2006 and the projected cost from the regional commission uh, being that it would be between 75 and 100 
a 50,000 current estimate. Now, obviously, that is based on the depth that you intend to go into, whether or not you're going to be having a lot of public meetings to discuss all these issues uh, and have that consultant there or not. So that that's flexible, mm -hmm. but we have to have direction from you guys as far as tell us what you want. Well, let me add, you know, I'm going to ask this question, um, again, for clarification. In some of these areas that we're talking about, is it possible for us to have on the zoning map some areas that we've identified that we're going to be moving forward with rather than going to the property owners and actually changing the zoning? Is it easier for us to identify those processes as far as where they need to be at? Just talking to the media, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, she has an answer to your question because she also serves on the zoning board. Well, that's good, but she's part of the media right now. She's not in the I media, got so. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I actually it. was the question that I was going to ask Dave. So I tried to, Carmel and I spoke briefly, but I didn't get a chance to ask her. I mean, we need to look at the information that they're getting and what they're seeing month in and month out. And, and if, you know, if it needs to be changed in the ULDC to avoid all of those variant request applications. Yeah, those I, I suspect, based on what I see, is that, is that the um, Zoning Board of Appeals, their workload has increased because there's been a higher request for variances. You have two and a half pages behind this that discuss the overlay subdivision requirements, buffering, um, sign, ordinance, uh, the administrative waivers and pre-apps. Those are just the ones that staff are concerned about from an administrative standpoint that they deal with, not the issues that y'all have discussed here concerning those oh, development right. areas, water, sewer, those right. kind of things. So, but, that's not that. so just for clarification, so this <coughs> includes comments from Carmela that come as a result of applications through the Zoning Board of Appeals. This is from planning staff. Now, the thing concerning signs that some of y'all have asked about, the chairman and I discussed this a, couple of years, a year ago, legislation was introduced and passed concerning signs that basically nullified, or I think nullified, uh, the majority of the sign ordinances that were in existence at that time. So we're working with the attorney to come up with a proposed sign ordinance that will conform to the law and bring to you guys for y'all to look at it and then tell us how you want to tweak it, if at all. And when you say sign, you're talking mm -hmm. about also billboards, those big, big ones outside mm -hmm. and all? Yes. Mm -hmm. at the, the proximity of one sign to another sign the flashing signs versus the, the uh, standard billboards, uh, bi uh, signs on businesses, <laughs> on the building itself, whether it's out next to road frontage, all of those have to be considered. Um, to your point earlier, though, about do you just identify those areas instead of officially rezoning them initially? When the ULDC was adopted in 2006, there was a new zoning map that came with that. We spent a year beyond what the initial cutoff was supposed to be. The commission um, extended twice the deadline for people who their zoning was changed as of, as an, uh, because of the adoption of the new map. They wanted to zone back. So <clears throat> you could spend a lot of legal time trying to go through the process of changing that, and then you know people come in and say, no, 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 I don't, you know, we don't, we don't want that to ever be a possibility here. Or if our children don't keep this farm after we die, we want to make it real hard for them to subdivide it, kind of I, stuff. I, 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 we had those comments. So I think that um, identifying those areas that you all would be flexible on and not being public already to help guide development. Yeah. That might be a path of least resistance that's yeah. also cheaper um, and causes a lot less public angst. Yeah. Well, I think currently there's, and I've seen the map, 
and, and I should have asked for it, but I've seen a map that shows your urban development areas, your rural development areas. We may want to take the time to get those maps and look at those and see if that needs to be changed and then use that as a guide for us to look at development and the request for development as well as how those areas are voted. You're talking about those census designated maps? Yes, I think okay. so. Yeah. Yeah. I get that's that correct. Mm -hmm. That'll help us see exactly where that growth is and then the areas that we need to focus in. But I think it's important for us uh, to be proactive and work along with developers but at the same time, by setting some boundaries, you're going to encourage development in particular areas, and that's where we are in a position for that for that growth, uh, so that we can be able to provide the services that we need to ex as we expand our utilities. It also is going to put a, bit, a larger demand, as we talk about, for a lower or a, I'm sorry, a higher density. Um, zoning in those areas, so potentially we need to look at those. Yep. So is there anything, again, I'm going to ask this question one more time, is there anything that staff needs to know that is a specific concern that a commissioner has with the current ULDC that they've had issues with that that is outside of what staff already recommends that's not on that list that needs to be added. I don't know if this applies, but it's home occupation, business license, business. I don't know what to do with it. We've had some concerns over it in, in my district. I don't know if we just need enforcement of the rules, the standards. It's uh, chapter five. You book ULBC. And specifically to that is um, how it affects the neighbors around somebody that's, that's wanting a home occupation business. Well, I think. You're thinking about that waste, yeah. waste coming down. I think what you're seeing is, um, and you touched on it, it, it comes back to a lot of things that you have in place. They're no stronger than what your, your ability or willingness to enforce. And enforce means enforcing fairly with everyone all the way across the board. I think when you really look at... Um, well, what, what's not happening is on page 5-4, Standards for Home Occupations, mm -hmm. letter H, the home occupation shall not constitute a nuisance to the surrounding neighborhood. And there's a lot of cases where it's a nuisance. Well, I think that that's, um, again, it, as to the neighbors, I guess, it is enforcement. The problem, the problem with that is, is that there's going to have to then be some language put in there to determine to identify what you would say would be a nuisance, well, so that so that when a, an applicant for a home occupation comes in, then staff has got some guidelines that they can look at. Now, you know, I, rather when you hear about it, it's after it's after the fact. They come in, they've gotten their their home occupation license, and then all of a sudden you've got a neighbor that says hey, this is going to be a nuisance to me. Well, that's after the fact. Yeah. We've already list, issued the business license. They can operate as a home occupation. Well, two so, things that come to my mind, and it's in, it's in age, uh, odor, smell, and noise. Of course, it outlines several things in here. The uh, use of machinery or equipment that produces noise, smoke, odor, vibration, electrical interference, or other objectionable conditions. I guess it's, it's covered in there. It's just getting something done about it okay. beforehand, like you're saying. Yeah. I guess a better screening of somebody who's wanting to do this mm -hmm. to find out exactly what that business is going to generate. Okay. You ask that question again tomorrow. Sure. Yeah. Be glad to. Because I, I'm trying. I, I got yeah, something, but I, I just got to find a way to frame it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll make a note here. We'll come back to home occupation. Well, or specifically.
specifically, you know, I wanted to I wanted to review all these staff comments, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Okay. Where is that, little Scott? The, the comments, you know, the, the recommendations from staff. Page two. I also have some concerns about a session accessory page. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's in the problem. Yeah. Here. Okay. What page? Is it? Okay, staff rec. I got it. Staff rec. Okay. Okay. Anything else on ULDC? On this, uh, yeah, I've got that. We'll, we'll, we'll take on this development thing. Are you aware of it? That it's a pretty good side of piece of property. So So we want to move on then. Can we take a short recess? Yeah. I think I've got something I need to do and then.